to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa International Programs, and the University of Iowa's Honors Program. They contribute the vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also thank the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support, and I thank today's special sponsors, Taxes Plus and Sue Dulek. Our programs are made possible by the financial support of these sponsors. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, H. Glenn Penny. Glenn is a professor of modern European history at the University of Iowa. Much of Glenn's work is focused on relations between Germans and the non-Europeans over the past two centuries. Glenn has written many books on this topic. He is cur currently engaged in an in-depth study of German interactions with Guatemala and completing a book manuscript titled Networked Spaces, German Schools in Latin America Since the 1880s. Please join me in welcoming Glenn Penny. Thanks a lot, Peter, and thanks to Ed for inviting me, and to all of you for coming in on this beautiful day. Uh, Ed uh, asked me to talk for about 30 minutes, and. I'm sure some of you would be delighted if I stopped earlier, but uh, I promise not to go beyond 1 o'clock. Uh, and basically what I thought I would do is uh, introduce you to, uh, on the one hand, a whole series of events that are going on at the university. They're all open and free to the public, and I'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. Uh, but I also want to tell you how I got there, uh, because a lot of times uh, the process of sc scholarly uh, research or what we do over in the university over there is sort of mystifying. So I'm going to demystify it for you, and I hope I don't disappoint you while I do it. Um, <clears throat> because one of the things that I think is most important about this story in terms of my own personal intellectual biography is that I lived here for over a decade, and I never actually walked in the State Historical Society. I walked by it an awful lot, rode by it on my bike, drove past it, but never really thought about why I might go in there. Um, until and this is, a, this is a completely a true story, until uh, I was asked if I didn't want to teach a freshman seminar, which is a one credit hour class that they had initiated at the University of Iowa. And I thought, sure, why not? And they were competitive, and they paid you a little money. And I thought, well, how am I going to get students to take this one credit hour class on German immigration when, when you know, they can take all these other really great classes? So I thought, well, I know. I'll title it Oktoberfest in the Midwest. <laughs> I'll just pander to them. It's, why not? It's for money, right? Um, so I did. And uh, as you might expect, I got some of the worst students I've ever seen. Uh, it served me right, right? Um, and they, initially, I had set up a syllabus where the idea was I was going to introduce them to Germans in various different places, uh, one, of, one of the places, of course, being Iowa City. Um, and I called up the archivist, Mary Bennett, who, if you don't know her, I recommend getting to know her. She's a fantastic woman who knows everything about this topic. Um, and I asked, would you give us a little tour of the archive? And she said, sure, why not? And I said, okay, well, I'll bring my students over there. And, and, and I, I thought it would be just no problem because I, I was going to have these great students. Of course, one of them had, um, when I gave them the first assignment, which was read a, a novel um, on a topic which was basically a family, in, in, a German family in, in Iowa, she asked me if it was available on tape. And I said, well, I, I don't actually know. Why do you ask? And she said, well, I don't really do that reading thing. And I... Uh, <laughs> I, at that point, realized what a mess I'd gotten myself into. So uh, I said, well, you know, um, I'm sure you'll make your way through it. And then I paused and, you know, I, I realized afterwards, I shouldn't have asked. And I said, so why did you take the class? And she said, well, it's not too far from my dorm. And I said, OK, great. So um, fantastic. Well, neither's the archive. Uh, and here's the address, and I'll see you there next week. And. Um, and then what happened was basically something that fits very into my central research methodology as a historian. I sort of fell in, I bumbled in backwards into an incredible resource. So I took these students in there, and Mary Bennett opened up 
a treasure trove of resources that after about five minutes had them glassy-eyed and completely blown away. And I was drooling and asking, holy moly, how do I get my hands on more of this stuff? I didn't know that she'd have pictures of the Schwabian Menners Corps, right? A, a choir of men all from Schwabenland in Germany living in Burlington, Iowa. That she'd have pictures of other groups from Schleswig-Holstein and Davenport. Or, 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 or. And in fact, it was unbelievable. And what I realized was also that this wasn't just turning me on, but that the students these particularly uh, recalcitrant students, uh, loved it. In fact, as one started to wonder what was going on and pick up his cell phone, she just simply stopped him and said, excuse me, what's your name? And he said, what? And she said, but what's your name? And he told her her name, and she looked at him, and then she walked over, and she pulled off his census. She opened it up, and she said, your family's from Prussia. And he went, what? Oh, my gosh. And he took a picture of his cell phone and sent it to his mother. And then he started looking for other members. And this is basically what happened and what continued to happen. And by the way, the student who didn't read found out that in the Iowa Women's Archive, there are tons and tons of photo albums from people who brought what they had with them when they came to the United States as migrants or immigrants or refugees. And she sat there with one particular set of photo albums and said, you know, I used to make photo albums with my grandmother, and she was hooked. She wrote a great paper in the end. I don't know if she read it, but she definitely wrote it. Um, so what I learned was two things. First of all, that uh, the history of Iowa has been poorly served, that a tremendous amount of the state's history is written in German, and most of the people who have written about the state haven't read it. And that's a pity, so I hope to change that. Um, the other thing I learned is that students might be engaged when they're listening to lectures about an abstract Germany far away, places that they might want to see or perhaps have some connection to. Um, but everybody le loves to read other people's mail. And if you take them to the archives and you open up the boxes, they get it. They understand it. They understand that there's a fundamental difference for, between listening to a, some historian, like me, drone on, or actually doing history themselves. So what I started to do was basically integrate trips into the archives into every class I teach. At one point, I completely mm, befuddled, I guess, the, the people at the Iowa Women's Archive when I said, hey, would it be any problem if I brought a class over? And they thought, yes, nice little seminar. And they said, sure, we can accommodate that. And I said, great, I have 75 students taking German history. Can you do it on Wednesday? And they did. And they divided it up. And this was the other thing, is that it wasn't that much space. So they gave each of them a, a box or two to look at. They weren't assigned to do anything together, but you put three of them on one box, and suddenly they were working with each other. With each other. Now, we call that group work in our classrooms, and it generally doesn't work. But this time, it worked fantastically. So I learned something else. So as you can see, we can all learn. Um, and in the end, uh, I hope that still works. I kinda, I'm hyper, so I'm going to be moving around. And if you can't hear me, just raise your hand and say, speak up. Get closer to the mic. Um, but you know, I don't want to hit it. Um, anyway, so students in my class has actually taught me a lot of things. I mean, even, and I should have figured this out earlier, even when I was just teaching regular, straightforward German history, I would teach classes, I would teach things from this book called, by Ma a man named Mac Walker called German Hometowns, which, if you haven't read it, fantastic, excellent description of the Holy Roman Empire, the way in which it worked, and how German towns played into it. And I would talk to them about the character of these hometowns, and usually, and, and this happened consistently, and after a few years I figured it out, some student would raise his or her hand in the back of the class and say, you know, it sounds just like where I grew up when they grew up in Iowa. And after a while I realized, well, that's because they live in German hometowns too. And I started asking them questions and they say, oh yeah, yeah, the whole town's German. Or, or it's split, it's split between the Germans and the Bohemians. They live on that side of the town and we live on this side. And then I would drive to the town and I couldn't see the Bohemians. I couldn't see the Germans. They all seemed to go buy their gas at the, at the quick stop and their groceries at the, at the Hy-Vee and, and I, I didn't see any distinctions, but they knew them. And then I started to look a little closer. And it's a lot of, like a lot of things in the Midwest, which I'm sure you already know this, but having grown up in Colorado, I was spoiled with sort of bombastic vistas, right, that get in your face and tell you that they're majestic and you should love them. Um, and when I came here, I looked around and I said, where's the nature? I don't get it. It's just all farmland. And uh, my ignorance was sort of pouring out of every pore. And, and I walked around disappointed and disenchanted for a while until I bothered to look. Right? And then when I started to look a bit, little bit more closely, I started to realize that actually every sunset is beautiful and there's plenty of nature if you know where to ferret it out. Um, and the same thing's true with the Germans in Iowa. They're all over the place. You just have to know how to look for them. Um, so I started. And uh, as we started to look for them, 
uh, we found them almost everywhere. And as we started to find them, um, and by we, I mean two or three of my colleagues, Glenn Erstein and the German department, and Lisa Heinemann, also in the history department, as well as our students, and other students who took classes with some of our colleagues who agreed to accommodate it, to the point where we had hundreds of students actually looking for Germans in Iowa, and they found them all over the place. Uh, and they taught me a tremendous amount. And this whole idea of doing global history locally came from working with these students who weren't just ferreting out Germans in Iowa, but were actually writing the history of Germany by looking at uh, Iowan sources. And that's really the, that's the big takeaway. So one of the things they started to do was to show me that um, there's German family history, community history, state history, everywhere. And we can see this in lots of different examples. Now, one of the examples people like to hear the most about is beer, of course. Uh, that's why I got all the students to come to that first class. And it turns out that it's not just about Oktoberfest, but about beer production, consumption, distribution. And the things I learned were things like this. Um, in the 19th century, Iowa is a hotbed for beer production. There's some 130 breweries by the time we get to the 1880s. A lot of them the vast majority of them are, are created and run by and uh, and driven by Germans. Um, that's who works in them. That's who, But they don't just buy the beer. They actually visit the places because they have, well, beer gardens, which are for conviviality, family, networking, people coming together. And there's a mode of drinking that's not just, well, what you'd see here on the Ped Mall on any given Thursday night, but the kind that has, you know, actually engagement, conversation, interaction. Um, and so... What we found was in all of these different breweries, there was this community building going on that did many things. Now, what I also learned and didn't know beforehand was that Iowa was one of the five states to try and uh, outlaw the distribution, production, consumption of alcohol, and there were repeated votes, and um, sometimes it would come in, they would get pushed out. In 1884, and you may have read about this, it's been in the, uh-oh, does it still work? Okay. Um, it, it's been in the newspapers a couple times. Uh, there, was a, there, there was an effort to try and close down beer production in Iowa City. So you may not, you may or may not know this, that if you just go right down the street, down Lynn Street to Marker, um, that you're standing on the site of where there were th once three breweries. And you're standing above a whole interconnection of catacombs, basically, of, of beer vaults and tunnels that supplied that production. And one of the breweries was owned by the Englert family. So you probably know about the theater. I knew about the theater. I didn't know about the brewery. So when they tried to close down the production of alcohol in Iowa City, there were riots. And the riots were pretty exciting, and they made it into a lot of newspapers. And, uh, you know, well, you know, you can't really blame a German for being denied his beer, going out on the street and complaining. But that's not really what it was about. It wasn't so much about uh, the ability to get your drink. I mean, you could brew it up in your bathtub. We learned that in the 20s. Um, it was more about economy. Because it turns out that the three breweries in Iowa City drove most of the economy in Iowa City. And it wasn't just because people liked to drink. It was because there were people doing all sorts of things for the breweries, right? They weren't just making beer. They were making the barrels that the beer goes in. They were distributing it. They were driving the wagons. They were selling it to well, restaurants and bars and places that would then distribute it. And it's not just about the workers. So when you stop the production of beer, you don't just stop that part of the economy. You stop the agricultural economy all around the brewery as well. Because after all, this is a period in which there's not a lot of in, uh, international transportation. So where do you get the hops and the barley and the wheat and whatever it is you're making your beer out of? You get it from local farmers. So actually, the area all around Iowa City wasn't just soy and corn, which is what I was used to, but many other things that were going into the production of these drinks. Now multiply that 130 times across the state, and you see how important the economy of beer production was for the state economy and how intertwined those local economies were. If you do away with that, all the farmers have to go producing something else, something that gets sold on a world market where the profits actually go outside the state ultimately as well. So local economies were being driven by this production that was inherently German. I didn't know. I do German history all the time. It was happening right under my feet. It's amazing, isn't it? So there's more. Um, make sure I don't lose my... Oh. Yeah, the other thing I found was that if I really wanted to understand this, I hoped that, well, I would just go to the history of Iowa and I'd read more about this, right? So I pulled off the books on the shelf. There are a couple. I looked at the student textbooks. There are a few. Um, none of them really said much about this. And then I pulled off from the uh, Annals of Iowa the one article on alcohol production, and it was quite interesting, but there was no uh, discussion from a German source. 
Turns out there's a 700-page book written by a guy named Eibach, who was a, uh, an editor of a newspaper, a German-language newspaper. There were 60, by the way. Iowa City had three. A German-language newspaper in Des Moines. He wrote a 700-page history of Germans in Iowa and everything they'd done. And it came out in 1900. He has a lovely chapter on beer, beer production, prohibition, and what the politics were around it. Turns out the production of alcohol is highly contentious in the 19th century. That's why you have temperance movements. And the people who are voting for and against it are divided by all sorts of things. Sometimes it's religion. The Germans are generally voting for it, whether they're Catholic or Protestant. But when you start to break down the American Anglo speakers, as we might call them, they're divided along other lines. A lot of women's movements who, form, who, who support the temperance movements are actually interested in limiting the production of alcohol because they see it as a way to reduce domestic violence with good reason. On the other hand, in some cases, the Germans are voting against women's suffrage because they're afraid that if women get the vote, they'll vote against alcohol production. So you see, the politics become somewhat complicated, and none of this really made sense to me until I read the chapter by Eibach, which was written um, 117 years ago, and which most historians of Iowa hadn't been able to read. So one of the great things that happened as we started to do this project is and we were letting the students loose is that Glenn Erstein had a student translate the chapter from German to English so it can be published in the annuals of Iowa so that you can all read it and enjoy it as well, unless you read German, and then you can just go straight to the source. And this is the point. What we're doing is basically a joint production. It's not my production. I'm just one of the many people who are sort of following behind as the students pick up steam and they do the projects themselves. So that's one of my examples. I have, I have more. <laughs> um, I, I learned also from Eibach that in addition to everything else, that when they actually did manage to turn off the flow of alcohol, that state revenues dropped precipitously. So there was more at stake in the production of alcohol, stopping it and getting it back up and running than I'd ever actually understood. Um, now, as my students, even these students in my very first class, started to understand this, they started to do research on their own hometowns, and they found all sorts of things. And one of the students who was in this first class actually came into class one day very excited. He hadn't done much research. He'd just gone to the Internet and started searching around about his town. And what he found was there was a state archaeologist up there digging about. And the state archaeologist had found a foundation in somebody's farm field. And they weren't sure what it was. And they started to dig, and they started to dig, and they got into it. And when they popped open the inside, they found a bunch of hops laying on the ground inside on the floor. And they knew immediately what it was. It was a brewery. And for the student, it was a fantastic revelation because he said, hops, where'd they get the hops? They don't grow hops around my town. And I just stood there for a minute and the wheels were turning and turning. And he went, huh, I bet they did. And I said, you know, I think you're right. And he started to dig into it a little bit more. And he realized too, wow, the entire landscape, the agricultural landscape, the way Everything would have looked as people moved from my town to another town, as we moved from city to, to country. Everything would have looked different. Huh. And then he started to sit and wonder, I wonder if there are any pictures. And that was the last I saw of him. He took off, went to the library, and he's probably still there. Um, and this is actually one of the things, right? It's a hook. It's exciting. These are students. Many of them were not history majors. They started to take this class, and they, they wanted to know more. And that is the virtue. It's like a really good museum. I'll get to the museum in just a second. A museum functions most effectively when it doesn't just tell you a story didactically, but it leaves you walking out with wonder. And you come out and you say, I want to know more about that. And then you go to the sources. And this is what this project has done for me, and it's done for a lot of my students, and my students have done for me during the process. Um, so it, it's hard for me to look down without hitting my head on the mic. So um, The other thing that's, that's pretty amazing is uh, the treasure trove of literature um, that's produced by the people who are living here. And by literature, what I really mean, I mean, as a historian, I would call these archival documents. But they're really collections of letters um, and newspapers and other things that we can read. And a lot of these letters are written in English, and you can read them right now. So the website. Um, one of the places that you can go and read them is in the museum exhibit that we put up that was based on undergrad that is based on undergraduate research and it's right across the street in the old capitol and it looks like that and at the in the in the museum exhibit what you're going to see are a number of things a lot of them are letters they're newspapers some of it we translated for you some of it is in english along the back wall is a whole series of letters um, and those letters are written by iowans to the governor of iowa during the first world war 
Because one of the most amazing things about the story of Germans in Iowa, of course, is that, and you'll see this if you go to the exhibit, you walk down the right-hand side, the wall's all about the 19th century, and it's mostly about the rise of German Iowa, the successes, how people came from Europe and landed in Iowa, what they did here, what they built a lot, uh, most of the most of the the um, the living structures, I guess you could say. Uh, they turned a lot of the land into agricultural land. They built a lot of the businesses. Um, there's a whole list of variety of things they did. They came from all sorts of places, right? German is not really a unitary category. It's made up of people from lots of different directions, which is why the Schwäbische Menoskur, they all sing together. They're all from Schwabenland. They're not going to sing with the Prussians. They hate the Prussians, but they're all German. Um, so they come here, and there are various backgrounds, and they set up their different churches. And of course, it's the same is true. I mean, the Protestants and the Catholics aren't going to start marrying just because they moved to the United States. They put up different churches. And the Germans, Catholics, aren't going to go to the same church with the Irish Catholics either. Well, you've got to have priorities, and you've got to have standards. So uh, so they create their own church, or they divide the church until they can't. Um, so we start to learn about the diversity of the Germans, right, who are s settling here. But what we also learn is that generally across the board, they're incredibly productive, and they're welcome. In fact, there's there are pamphlets, there are booklets created saying, please come, immigrate to Iowa. And they're, they're translated into multiple language, German, one of the foremost, and they're sent to Europe along with people who are soliciting them. And they bring the immigrants here, and they settle, and they do well. They do very well. And in some places like Carroll, for example, in Iowa, they become a dominant group, or Bremer County, for example, overwhelmingly. Davenport, which we already know, I think I mentioned ago, but Clinton County as well, as I could go down the list, um, lots and lots and lots of Germans. And they, they're part of the municipal politics, the state politics, they're part building schools, they're building newspapers. I think I mentioned a good minute ago that there are 60 German language newspapers. They're incredibly productive members of society. Then we get to the First World War. And we learn a lot. We learn about the vulnerability of civil liberties. We learn that multicultural, multilingual Iowa is suddenly a problem. And Iowa not only has the distinction of that early prohibition, it's one of the few states that actually goes about outlawing all foreign languages during the First World War. And German, of course, most importantly. Let me just check my time. Um, good. Oh, good. Don't want to go over. Um, so. One of the things that's most important about this, of course, and my students were just puzzling this in a class yesterday. So they walk down the wall on the right-hand side, and they see all this incredible production, contribution, and then suddenly you just hit 1914, and it all just starts to twist and turn and become a problem. And you wonder, how can the same individual who's been living here for 30 years go from being someone we wanted to entice, someone we wanted to have, someone who's paid taxes, built up a, a helped to build up a community, a state, suddenly become a pariah when they didn't do anything differently. Ah, this is the interesting thing, isn't it? Of course, the long-term explanation is fairly straightforward. Um, you have a war in Europe. You have lots of propaganda. In order to fight a war, you have to dehumanize the enemy. There's lots of English and French propaganda. The undersea cables are cut. The British are in control of a lot of the information. You have a president, Woodrow Wilson, who's overwhelmingly an Anglophile, who's trying to figure out a good way to get the United States into the war and eventually manages it after he's reelected for a second term. And during this time, a lot of propaganda circulates. Now, one of the things you may not expect is that there's also pro-German propaganda, and plenty of it. So if you go to the museum display, you can see lots of images of that, and um, you don't even have to go to the museum display. You can go to the website. If you got one of those little cars that got passed out, you can go to the website and find a lot of this right on the website because, and I'll show you this in just a second, we've uploaded a lot of the resources. Now, if you do go to the museum display, one of the things you'll see is along the back wall this whole series of letters from people, and they're reacting to... Um, the change that takes place in 1917 when the U.S. enters the war. So the age of neutrality is in a, a period of consternation for the first few years when European states are tearing each other apart and the Americans are wondering whether or not they should join in. Um, after the Americans enter, well, it comes here. And it comes here quickly, and it's amazing how quick it is. Um, and what we see very quickly uh, along with that are old scores being settled in new ways. So... Um, in many Iowa towns, we, we can see tons of letters being written to the governor saying, thank you very much for your proclamation against the use of the German language. We have a lot of Huns who live here, and they've been in control. This is the word they use, not me. Um, and they've been in control of the township for a long time. They have a school as well where supposedly it's a German-English school, but we think they only speak German there. And it's a problem, and we're wondering if it's okay, according to your proclamation, to break in because we'd like to burn their books. 
Um, I'm not exactly sure, and you can read the letter. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how the governor responded, but there's another letter that's actually from there in the exhibit from Spirit Lake from a young man who writes something similar, except he says, thanks so much for doing away with the German language. I never liked my German class, and I'm helping to burn the books. Um, and it's not just in Spirit Lake where they're burned or up in northeastern Iowa, but in Davenport we have lots of pictures of people in the post-burning of the books. They burn the books so quickly that we only really have people around the ashes. Um, so it's not a great picture. Um, um, they should have gotten a little bit earlier. Uh, but there's plenty of book burnings because suddenly all things German became things that were, well, part of the destruction of civilization. And what's really amazing is the propaganda posters. We have four up on the wall at the exhibit. I, I really encourage you to go look at it. Um, if you like it, the website will take you to other places where you can look at more, where the, what was British and French propaganda, anti-German propaganda, became American propaganda, where you not only have, for example, a mailed fist held up high. This is Prussianism, right? Because I, I mean, the Shrabians would have hated to hear it, but all Germans were ultimately Prussian. Um, but you hold up this fist with the spikes on the knuckles, and this is going to crush, the Germans are going to crush civilization. And that crushing is going to come across the Atlantic and hit New York. So one of the posters we have on the wall is a poster which, believe it or not, is from the, again, from the archive. It was two blocks from my office that I didn't know about. Um, it's a picture of the Statue of Liberty being uh, destroyed by German planes in New York going on, uh, exploding in fire. So this is a striking thing because what we have is um, sort of a multicolor technochronic version, as you can, of the 1917 of uh, uh, German anti-civilization destroying the United States. So this is how you whip up a crowd in most of the Iowa against their neighbors. Um, and as a result, if you go and you walk around and you look at just those eight letters we have on the wall, what you'll see is a progression from people writing the governor, not just about book burnings, about how they're beating up people who speak German on the street, how they like to undermine the city council because they're all a bunch of Huns and they've been in charge for decades. It's a kind of an inconsistency, but that didn't matter. Um, but now they have a good reason to get them out of power because no longer the German group who controlled things, and people didn't like that for whatever reason, maybe because they wouldn't close the saloons, but now they're the group that's obviously supporters of the Kaiser, obviously supporters of the, the, the bad guys in, in Europe, and now we found a way to really usurp their position. If you take a look up at, at Loudoun and, and, and West Branch, not too far from here, West Branch is a completely a dry town. Loudoun was a totally wet town, almost all German. And the same thing happened there. There's tensions between the two. The First World War gives West Branch the upper hand. So this is something else students pointed out to me, and we all learned very quickly, is that the First World War not only taught us about the vulnerability of civil liberties, but the pettiness of a lot of people when they turn on their neighbors, basically for all sorts of reasons. Um, and you can read these letters. You can read thousands of these letters from every single county in Iowa. And it's astounding. Now, there, there is good news. Um, it's not all grim. Uh, because after the First World War, uh, things change again. It's very interesting. And some of my, my students who went to visit the exhibit um, just this week and wrote a little response paper on it noticed it immediately. They wanted to know, how does it then toggle again? How does German go from being a positive characteristic to a negative characteristic? And then by the time of the Second World War, back to being a positive characteristic. And they learned a lot about ethnicity, ethnicity and immigration again in the United States. So during the interwar period, a number of things happened. Two things extremely important. In 1921, we have a new set of laws about immigration that sets up quotas. 1924 extends those laws. You used to be able to get around the quotas by simply traveling to Mexico and then coming up over the border, but actually the quotas got solidified. And as a result of these quotas, you had a decline in a lot of these older groups of Europeans, or I'm sorry, you have a decline in a lot of newer groups of Europeans who, who came bring with them a new threat. So for example, a lot of East Europeans were seen as problematic because they were a tie to the rise of communism and Bolshevism and the Soviet Union in the interwar period. This is a new threat that's, that's scaring a lot of people in the United States. And as a result, limiting the, those groups coming into the United States is good. And the groups that are already here start to suddenly be integrated into a sort of a white, middle-class American who is, well, us, not them. And this is a fascinating transition that the students picked up on right away. And it takes place across the United States. So that by the time we get to the Second World War, there's, there's no harassing of Germans, just the opposite. They're being brought into the intelligence service. They're being brought into the military. They're becoming part and parcel of the fighting forces that go and take part in the Second World War. They're not being interned. Japanese Americans are being interned. 
So there's another group that can be focused on, that gets turned on, and Germans become integrated into the mainstream. And this, too, for my students, was a fascinating transition to watch, and they were able to pull it out of the exhibit. Um, so you can go take a look at that as well. Um, now, there's more. Uh, I have to look down. And it's hard because my glasses don't work from this direction. Um, just, uh, the, the other thing that's quite important about this that we learned from the first, Second World War is that um, when we end the First World War, we know a number of things happen. We know, for example, that some towns in Iowa change their name, go from Berlin to Lincoln or from um, another name to Lakota or from another name to some other town. We know this happens. We know that in towns all over the Midwest, street, street names are changed. This is very consistent, and the German names are done away with. We know in, in Dubuque, Iowa, for example, which is an overwhelmingly German town, has a tr one of the biggest breweries, the Star Brewery, an amazing place. It's just gigantic. It's amazing just because of its industrial capacity. Um, we know that this town, too, they, all the businesses change. The German names go off banks. They go off the industries. They go off the breweries. They go off everything just willy-nilly in a matter of months. It's amazing when you look at the city directories and, and watch this transformation take place. We also know that the German language newspapers largely get, stop circulating or change over to English. This is true even in Davenport, an overwhelmingly German town where the Davenport newspaper itself basically just close itself down in order to demonstrate its own patriotism. Um, so the argument usually when one looks at, excuse me, <clears throat> when one looks at the general history of the Midwest and the United States is that there's a decline in the interest and in, in use of German. And this is true, we know, in public places, and we know that the urban histories support this. But when you start looking at rural places like rural Iowa, it doesn't, it doesn't function that way. Because in places like Bremer County, people just keep speaking German. And yes, the public places are smaller, and yes, they don't they stop the publication of their German language newspaper, but they keep speaking German in the fields, they keep speaking German in the churches, they keep speaking German in many other locations. Now, the churches are an important location, and that was one of the problems during the Bible Proclamation, this effort to try and shut down the use of German language that was really important because... What we learn from the letters is that they're not just people in Iowa saying, hey, you can't let these, my neighbor speaking German. I've been listening to her on the phone line. This is bad. We know this happened. But also that there were pastors and priests and ministers and others who wrote to the governor and said, wait a minute. Um, we understand that we want to be in this war and that because we're in this war, we need to support it. We need to buy liberty bonds. But what I don't understand is why I can't preach in German. Because most of the people in my congregation have been here for decades and they never learned English. We never demanded it. So why are we going to demand it today? So what we see is actually a defense of these cultures by a lot of these priests and pastors at that time. Now, um, one, of the, one of them even asked if Latin was still okay, which I thought was really funny. Um, but uh, the, the governor really had no decent response. So what ends up happening is that German goes on the down low, so to speak. The German becomes something you use in private, becomes something you use on a farm, in the small villages, in the little towns, in the congregations when you know people. And I wasn't really aware of this, sort of the extent to which this was true, until, until two things happened. One, um, I was able to read a little bit about what happens with German POWs during the Second World War who come here. And a lot of my students were very interested in the Second World War rather than the First, and they started to dig into this, and they told me. And basically what happens is the German POWs, when they come and they get put in camps, are actually put to work on farms because a lot of the farm boys are out fighting the war, right? Maybe you saw Saving Private Ryan, or you remember this yourselves. Um, but the point is that they're, they're off, so they need the labor, so the young German men in these camps get sent out to labor, and they do. And what they realize immediately is this is no problem because they can speak German on the farms and the food's the same and everybody acts like they do at home and they integrate it very easily. Um, and some of the, some some individuals even liked it so much that after the war they returned as the next wave of German immigration. So we know that there is plenty of German culture and language and other things going on in the farms. But the other point, which I think is just as important, is we know this from other, other things too. We know this from looking at... Um, graveyards. And this happened to me oh, sort of as a lark. I was driving back from Minnesota. I was trying to avoid the interstate. And I was coming down sort of not too far from where the University of Northern Iowa is in Bremer County. I don't remember exactly which town I was driving past. And you know how it is. It was sort of winter and there's not a lot in the landscape to look at. And I saw a steeple coming up. You see a lot of them when you're driving down from Minnesota. And I thought, I bet that's a Lutheran church. 
And so I pulled over, and it was snowing, of course. It's typical, my research pattern. Um, and I walked into the snow, and I looked up, and I said, yes, it's a Lutheran church. And I looked over at the graveyard, and I immediately ran over to the stones that were closest to the road, the first stones, because they're old, they're small, they're white, they're sandstone. You know they're old. I'm like, there's got to be some Germans here. So I walked over, and I started to look at the stones, and I was right. But, of course, they're old, and they're sort of washed out, and I couldn't really see them very well. So I started to step back, and then I continued to step back. And as I got farther from the road, I got to more contemporary stones. And then I stopped, and I was looking at a field of gravestones that went from the 1970s back to the 1850s, and they were all the same names. And I stood there, and I thought, well, okay, this is it. And the most amazing part was staring at a stone right in front of me from the 1930s. Yeah, And from the 1930s, it's a beautiful new granite stone that's polished, and it has a sort of Grant Wood image of a tractor on it. It's fantastic. And all the lettering is German. And the eulogy is German. It's not just the name. Everything was still in German, right? And you know that when they had the ceremony, when they buried this individual, everything was in German. And it kept being that way right through the middle of the 20th century. Now, our histories don't, of the United States and German immigrants and ethnicity in the United States don't capture this very well because they tend to be focused on urban settings. And that's another thing that's so fantastic about having my students and myself run around the landscapes of Iowa is we get to choose. We can look at the towns, we can look at Des Moines and Davenport and Dubuque and others, but we can also look at the counties, Pottawatomie County. It's all up and down the West Coast. And this really should not have surprised me because I just have to check the clock again just a sec. Oh, I only have five minutes. I better run. Um, it shouldn't surprise me because once upon a time I wrote a book on the German love affair with American Indians. And one of the chapters is all about German America because I was interested in a guy who'd gone to the, the reservations in North Dakota in the 1880s. But the other thing that was important about the book and how this actually really turned me on to the question of Germans in the United States is that when he arrived in 1881 and he got off the boat in New York, he got off and he met pieces of his family, people who had immigrated before him. And he was introduced to Germans all over New York City, which, by the way, had the largest concentration of Germans almost anywhere and the biggest German language newspaper in the world, I think. Don't quote me on that one, but it's one of the biggest, definitely. Um, and then he traveled up and down the East Coast. He went up into New York. He went to Niagara. He traveled along on trains, on boats, on canals, and he walked a little bit. And the entire way, he took notes, and he collected newspaper clippings, all in German. He went down through Chicago, up to Milwaukee, shouldn't surprise you, a German town, over to St. Paul, where he was going to meet this man called Paul Boynton, who developed a proto wetsuit. In order to sell it to the Navy, he was going to float from St. Paul all the way to St. Louis. And this guy was a journalist, got on a boat, and wanted to follow him along, and he did. And I initially started to read about this and read his notes, read his diaries, because this interested me. I thought, this is a nutty thing to do. What's he doing? Um, and, but what I realized was that all along the way, every single stop, he landed in a German town. And he collected the German newspaper article, the article written in German about his trip through the town. Every single town, not just Gutenberg, not just Crystal City, all the way down Davenport, you name it, till he got down to St. Louis. It's a German river. He met... He met people who were friends. He, he, he drank beer from Koblenz, and he saw the new breweries. He was served coffee and cake along the way. And I was blown away. I had no idea, and I'd lived in the state for a decade. And it t turns out that if this guy had just gone on down till he hit the, the, the branch and headed up the Missouri, he would have seen exactly the same thing. Western Iowa was populated in the same way. So... Um, I'm going to have to stop, but I want to show you some more of my revelations. And this is in um, this is what I'd like you to be able to do. Uh, first of all, I'd like you to understand that this was only the first the first talk of many this week. And then if you have the opportunity, there's lots of things you can go see. They're all open to the public. You can go to this website. I passed around some cards earlier. There's a symposium taking place. The great Frank Trommler is going to talk at 3.30. It's fantastic. If you don't get to see him today, you can come and see him tomorrow in the afternoon. Um, you can see on Thursday, October. 6, some guy named Glenn Penny is going to introduce him. Um, but that will, you can bear it, and uh, you'll wait for the, the Tomler address, which will be even better, um, the Tromler address. And then it just keeps going on to Friday. Uh-oh, I hope I didn't screw everything up. Um, 
Well, there are many other things. Uh, again, if you're interested in the beer, you can come see the beer. If you want to come see this particular panel, which I'm particularly proud of, it's some of our undergraduate students who are going to be presenting some of the work that they've been doing along the way on these projects. And it's, it's going, they're, they're going to get a comment from a professor we brought over from Germany um, who's just going to rip them to shreds. No, she'll be very kind. Um, Heike Bungart, uh, she's a lovely woman. And, um, and you can participate in this as well. Now, if you can't make this, don't fret because there's more going on. Um, we have musical events going on theatrical events and if you can't make any of this because you're a recluse and you prefer your house it's no problem we've taken care of you uh, there is a, a digital version of the exhibits it's up you can read about it you can browse the items you can go to the collections we're tagging everything what we managed to do is get the students even though they were working in a dozen different classes maybe I'm exaggerating maybe it was only 10 um, to collect information from the archives and when they did it they they did it in a way that all the metadata the information tied to every single one of those letters every one of those images was all the same so we can go in here and you can search it maybe you want to know about your county go here and look maybe you want Want to know about your town? Go and look. I can't promise we have everything, but it's just beginning. We're going to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. So hopefully, if you're interested, you'll get a chance to take part in it. Now I have to stop or I'll get in trouble with Ed. Thanks very much. Given all the German towns in Iowa, how does one understand Dubuque, Des Moines, Prairie du Chien, etc.? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Okay. That, that's a trick question. Um, it's because the French got here first, and uh, they named a lot of the places, and then the Germans overwhelmed them. Uh, it was kind of like 1871. I'm just kidding. Um, that was an insider joke for German geeks. Uh, it, no, but seriously, so ta towns like Davenport, in fact, are founded by the French as well, uh, by French trappers and others, and it's a French trading center. But then eventually, um, those French either leave or are outnumbered by other Europeans. So a lot of these towns that were just listed, like Dubuque, um, have uh, a majority Germans in them by the time you get to the 1890s. What was happening in Germany in the 1840 to 1860 era to encourage so many Germans to immigrate to the U.S.? Oh, I know that one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, this is like my, my comprehensive exams. Um, <laughs> Uh, the big event is the 1848 revolutions. Uh, so you do have economic transformations that take place before that that are quite important. Um, you also, across Germany, have different kinds of what uh, immigration historians once upon a time would have called push factors, reasons for people wanting to leave. Sometimes it's because you're in an area that had served them and you could get out. Sometimes it's because you're in an area where there's a patrimony that requires a division of land. And because uh, of basically a hygienic revolution, more people are surviving and there's less land to go to descendants. So some people are leaving for that reason. Um, sometimes it's just because of taxes. Sometimes it's a desire to avoid military service. There's lots of reasons. But the big event is the 1848 revolutions. That's how you get Davenport and actually Iowa being settled by a lot of the people who are on the losing side of the revolution, who tend to be political liberals, active lawyers and journalists. And, and the town of Davenport is just full of them. And as a result, a place like Davenport has incredibly radical politics, so radical that um, you know, they're a, a completely in favor of John Brown, and when he gets in a lot of trouble, is executed. They're very upset about it. And if you read the German language newspapers at the time, they're very supportive. Andrew Zimmerman, by the way, who's coming to the symposium, will be speaking on, on, on Saturday, I think it is, is, is going to talk directly about this. Can you say a few words about German-Czech relations in eastern Iowa? Were the Czechs treated differently during World War I as well? Uh, guilt by association? So whoever asked that question was mean. Um, I don't have an answer directly. No, uh, I mean, on the one hand, Czechs would suffer under the same proclamation, the Babel Proclamation, where they're not supposed to speak Czech in public. And But however, what we do know is that overwhelming the enforcement was directed against German speakers and not the speakers of the many other languages that were being spoken here. That we know. What the relationships were like, I don't know. And this would be a fantastic research project for any student wanted to pursue it. Uh, because we, I do know that there are tensions in some places where Germans, Czechs living next to each other, don't necessarily like each other for whatever reason. Um, but more than that, I fortunately can't say. Like I said, there's more to be done. Have you seen the TV series Heimat about Germany in the mid-20th century? And I assume this is more than a yes-no question, so you may wish to comment on it too. <laughs> 
Uh, in fact, uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, all the graduate students went and watched all of the Heimat movies together. It was a long, painful experience. Um, <laughs> And, the, and that, that particular series, I think, was very popular in the United States as well. Um, most of it is about sort of coming to terms with, uh, uh, with National Socialism in Germany. But um, I think the question's particularly important because there's, uh, there's a new episode, so to speak, in the Heimat series. And the most poignant part of it is that it begins with a bunch of Germans arriving in Brazil. Um, in, a, in sort of an immigration mode. And to me, that's quite important because a lot of what we can see, I, I think they mentioned earlier that I do a lot of work on Germans in Latin America, and a lot of the process of settling in, Germans settling in when they, as immigrants, go to Russia or Eastern Central Europe or to Australia or to the United States or South Africa or Latin America, it's actually quite similar, the modes, the building of the churches, the schools, and things like that. So in that final Heimat movie, they capture it very well. And the earlier ones aren't really about that. Would you comment on German settlers into Ukraine and then their subsequent immigration into the Midwest? <laughs> okay, that happened. Um, the, the most important thing about, okay, the thing that's actually quite important about this is that um, when you look at German migration, uh, the migra migration of Germans out of the German-speaking lands, okay, I'm going to put on the history professor hat, there is no Germany before 1871, no nation state. But there is a German-speaking territory that's quite broad. Much of it is included in uh, an entity called the Holy Roman Empire, but it's broken up into many different provinces and states and free cities and things like that. Now, as these states and free cities engage with, engage with each other, lots of things happen that cause some German speakers to want to leave them. And the first waves of migration don't go west. They don't go to the United States. They don't go across the ocean. They go east. They go east into east and central Europe, into the Ukraine, into Russia. So the largest number of Germans living outside German-speaking territories are overwhelmingly in Russia or the Ukraine. Um, and that distinction, of course, changes over time as the border moves, as the empire grows, as we have the First World War and the creation of the Soviet Union and so on. Um, so the important point is that you have large numbers of German speakers living in German communities in the Ukraine and in Russia, who then, at the end of the 19th century, many of them were invited to live there. Um, they, were, they were brought in by the rulers, um, and they were given certain privileges. And then they start to lose those privileges in the 19th century um, for a large number of reasons, the, the most important of which is nationalism changes the game on what you're going to give out to citizens and even subjects by the end of the 19th century. So as they lose their privileges, is lots of these Germans, some of whom are Mennonite, some of them not, end up picking up and leaving. And some of them come to the United States and some go to Latin America. One of our students, in fact, John Eicher, who's a, a fantastic graduate student who's now in a postdoc at the German Historical Institute, actually wrote his dissertation about a group of Mennonites who do just this. Some of them leave very early in the 19th century. They go to Canada. And then after a while, they don't like the Canadians anymore. So they go to Paraguay. And not too long after they arrive, another group who came from where they were originally from in, in Russia goes directly to Paraguay. Um, so there's lots of movements of Germans from outside of Germany into the United States and Latin America as a result. The anti-war World War II wing of America First was big in Illinois. Were they here in Iowa also? Can I pass on that one? I, I don't know. What are the German and non-German areas of Iowa? And then a second uh, comment. Uh, Germans and style of agriculture with breaking the prairie in 1850 to 1900. I don't know if I got that, the I meaning of that sentence. But, uh. um, the answer to the question about the, the density of Germans, uh, I can't list all the counties off the top of my head. I, I mean, I mentioned some, like, uh, like Scott County and uh, Lee County and Des Moines County and uh, Potawatomi and Bremer. Um, they're not that many in Cedar, uh, but 
there are Germans all over. The thing is, and I, I hate to push it off into the website, but if you go there, they're actually listed in a very systematic fashion, and you can you can look. Um, you can also look at our newspaper map, which shows where the German language newspapers were, and where you see more than one, there are a lot more Germans, obviously, because they can have more subscription rates. So you can answer that question really quick, and I won't screw it up. Um, the, the question about farming and agriculture is actually quite interesting. Um, there was some really great work done in the middle of the 20th century on German agricultural patterns 